What a f nigger. Jeez, oh my god, what the f Media firestorm over words in three, two, one. So, the alleged economist Mark Blythe destroys the libertarian economist Milton Friedman. This will be good. The definition of a stupid economic idea is one that is immune to empirical refutation while being useful to specific constituencies. You mean like the prophecy foretold by the prophet of statism, John Maynard Keynes, that will become spoken of in the Hall of the State as a prophecy of Keynesian economics? It foretold an economic system designed to stabilize the ups and downs of the business cycle by expanding government spending during recession and contracting during booms, while doing everything it could to stimulate demand and encourage spending, discouraging savings. The high priesthood of statism will find value in any prophecy affirming the legitimacy of their god, the government, and the sacrifice of our freedoms upon the altar of the state. Naturally, it's not short-term gains at the expense of long-term consequences. So what's a good one? So have a look at that slide there. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> Sovereign borrower of the year, 2007. <laughs> The Hellenic Republic of Greece. I... Uh, I, can't, I can't see that. The audience is laughing, so I'm assuming it has something to do with the failure of fiat currency. I also can't parse his accent either. And the captions aren't too helpful. I guess it has something to do with Greece being awarded some fiscal sovereignty award in 2007, I think? Maybe? Pan up, camera. Right, that's that. actually, that sh actually happened. Do you kiss your mother with that mouth? Right. Now, I wrote a book in 2013 called Austerity, The History of a Dangerous Idea. You should all read it if you haven't already. It's a classic. And uh, basically, I got interested in this because the European Commission started to take seriously what I thought was the most stupid economic idea I'd ever heard of. But the West has all but embraced the Keynesian prophecy, excuse me, the neo-Keynesian prophecy of government spending being the ultimate economic good. Which begs the question, why is there any spending outside of the state if the government is so much better at it? Which is called expansionary fiscal contraction. Now, if you're basically going to have the public sec private sector deleveraging and the public sector deleveraging at the same time, and everybody's everyone else's trading partner and you all use the same currency, then the only thing that can happen is you will have a contractionary fiscal contraction. That's not what expansionary fiscal contraction means. I know this is boring finance talk, but bear with me. Put simply, the hypothesis suggests that under certain unspecified conditions, if government spending drops significantly, the private economy will expand. But both public and private sectors deleveraging? Yeah, that's not expansionary fiscal contraction. But they began to tell the story that there was going to be an expansionary one. Now, the story behind this is brilliant. So the, the everyday homily, of course, is the family budget and the state's budget. They're really just the same thing. This is your captain speaking. All passengers, put on your seatbelts. We will be experiencing some major stupidity shortly. So the family runs out of money, you stop spending, you tighten your belt, all that sort of stuff, right? And of course, the state's budget is completely different. Number one, families don't get to issue their own money. Families don't get to bring people into the family and then tax them for five generations. I mean, there's actually slight differences here. In other words, one is legally allowed to counterfeit money, drive up the supply of money, and decrease its value. It is allowed to steal from people and is inherently immoral. But the really big one on this is what I call the IKEA problem. And this is how, if you strip away all the econometrics of what this idea actually says, expansionary fiscal contraction. So you're in, let's say, Spain or Portugal. It's 2009, 2010. The economy's falling about your ears. You might have a job, but your wife works in the public sector, so you know pff, that one's going. Now, in a micro level, you want to tighten your belt, right? Which, of course, if everybody does it, is bad, because that's because of the contraction. I love how blase he is about that. This is the crux of the Keynesian lie. It's the same Paul Krugman nonsense that argues that Hurricane Irma is good for the economy because all those houses need to be rebuilt. Money that is saved is going to be spent anyway, just later and in a more efficient way, which is why it's being saved in the first place. The difference being that if the Keynesians have their way, 
the economy will still have that money minus the cost of that lost efficiency. In the short term, yes. If everyone stopped buying the random junk they didn't need, there'd be a contraction. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Unless you're a statist and you just want tax money right now. But you'll also know this idea called expansionary fiscal contraction. And you go, wait a minute, I just read in the newspaper that the government's going to slash the welfare state by 50%. Yes! <laughs> I wish. This is perfect. See, using my rational expectations, I then calculate my lifetime income, given the fact that this credible commitment to cut the budget has now come out. Recalculating it in this way, I know that my future tax burden 25 years from now will be much lower than I anticipated. Therefore, I've got so much more money now, I run out to Ikea and buy a couch, so does everybody else, and we cure the recession before it starts. I'm pretty sure that's not what the proponents of expansionary fiscal contraction argue. A cut in government spending and a cut in taxes aren't necessarily related. To assume one relates to the other is, well, stupid. Also, if you, as a couple, are tightening your budget, why would you buy a couch? That's actually a real idea. It also informed easy policy from 2009 through 2011. That's one stupid idea. Here's another one. Japan. Eric Lonergan at m and some of you might know him, very smart bloke, produced these two little charts. Japanese public debt. It's terrible, look, 200, oh my goodness, blah, 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 it's the worst thing, and we're all going to go the same way, and it's all terrible, we're all going to die of debt, forget, no, nobody's ever died of debt, but never mind. Wait, didn't you publish a book about how austerity is the worst thing in the world? Austerity meaning spending cuts and tax hikes to make up for budget shortfalls. Debtors are going to want their money back eventually. I'm surprised you're so blasé about debt. I mean, you like austerity? Because debt is how you get austerity. So anyway, they've got 200. Well, it depends how you look at it. If you look over there, what you see is basically the government in Japan has been buying government bonds. So if you do a net calculation and then you look at how much of the issues since 2010 they've been buying, you drop way below 100 really quickly. And they're generating inflation. So why are they trying to do that when nominal GDP hasn't dropped and also the labor market is functioning relatively well? You're doing it because you're doing it as an intergenerational wealth transfer, because you've got an old society with too many assets, and you want to basically burn those assets. You thieves! You're forcing your children to pay for your decadence. What the heck is wrong with you, Blith? You think it's okay for your kids to be saddled with debt and taxation? Oh wait, you don't have kids, do you? Just like your mentor Keynes, you selfish pricks. Stealing from everyone else's kids. Stealing from me! Given that I'm forced to pay for it anyway, I hope you choke on it. Think about it this way. If I owe myself a mortgage, and then I buy the mortgage back from myself, do I have any debt? <laughs> Wouldn't you still have to pay the mortgage? The exchange of the debt doesn't make the debt go away. The inflation puzzle. There's a fake king. Sweden. There's a fake economist. Mark Blith. Milton. <laughs> You wish you could hold a candle to Milton. And why is it? It's a head fake, but it's a real fake. There's no inflation anywhere. We were all raised on monetary theories of inflation. The 1970s is this very small end in the world, but we generalized everything from. We were just talking about this. And it's very interesting. You've got 13 trillion in long dated debt on the long end of the curve, 13 trillion in central bank intervention. And if you wipe the 70s out of your sample and go all the way back to 1350, I'll show you this in a minute, the long run real rate of interest for the globe is about 1.5%. You're taking the stagflation of the 70s out. I bet if you take every period after fiat currency was introduced, interest worldwide from that time period would look like 0.1% or something. And what matters for inflation isn't money. Milton was wrong. It's labor power. Because if you have closed national economies, and you have your own cash, and you target full employment, and you have strong labor protections, you will generate an inflation. You can get it through the import channel, Brexit's going to do that to Britain, etc. But the classic inflations in the 1970s come from a very specific institutional configuration, which now no longer exists. Right. <laughs> because Yugoslavia and the Weimar Republic had skyrocketing levels of labor power during their hyperinflationary periods. Let's go to Venezuela, see how their labor power is doing. I bet it's wonderful.
or maybe your stupid economic idea is immune to empirical refutation and is only useful to specific constituencies. You lied to me. Milton Friedman was not destroyed. He was mentioned once, but that's it. This apostle of the statist prophet Keynes, this alleged economist Mark Blith, just made a fool out of himself. Or is it pronounced Blythe? Blith? I don't know. I don't care!